This is Gene Lance with the Workers Beat Extra. Today, I've cornered historian Max Krokmal. And I want to talk to you, Max, about what's wrong with labor or why is it that people don't know anything about labor history nowadays? Sure. Well, thank you for having me, Gene. It's always great to be with the Workers Beat. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, there's, there's, you know, we talked a little bit beforehand. They're interrelated questions, right? There's the one question is why do people not know US labor history? And then I think to the extent that we do know US labor history, we, we tend to romanticize it and oversimplify it. And so the other, the other question is, you know, where did, where did labor go wrong? What, what can we learn from the past and actually help steer the movement in a, in a more progressive direction today? Uh, so to take the first part, um, why don't we know more about this? Well, the, the, the history, uh, well, we, we say history is written by the victors and the victors in the class conflict are unquestionably the capitalists. And um, you know the, the, the mainstream tellings we have of history, not necessarily just in schools, but you know, broad, more broadly in our culture um, are, are funded by the very same corporations that benefit from keeping workers powerless. And so that's problem number one, <laughs> right? Um, you know, within that broad framework, there are there are lots of great books out there. There's you know generations of of labor historians who have uh, recovered different parts of of the past of of working class struggle, including working class victories. You know, we've learned a lot about the possibilities and and promise of the labor movement um, and of other social movements. And so the, the the stories are out there, and in many cases they have been held onto or, or re reconstructed. Um, from fragmentary sources, but we have to keep working on, on getting that story told to a larger um, reading public. And, um, you know, we have some of the classics of US social history, like the People's History of the United States by Zinn, but, but I think um, folks tend to not see organized labor as a, as a central force in, 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 you know, progress in American history. And that's basically because the employers are the ones that control all of the publishing houses and the TV stations and the newspapers and everything else. Here's the- yeah, and, and beyond that to the, the um, you know, the, the movies, the fictional movies that are made and the textbook standards that are written and everything else. But yeah, go ahead, what do you got there? The, this is a fine book that uh, will stand up well to criticism. It's Blue Texas by Max Krakmal. And uh, I wanna thank you for having presented this book because Texas history is, is a fraud <laughs> for the most part. Yeah. It, it's really very hard to read Texas history if you have any idea what really happened. Uh, someone called my radio station just the other day and was celebrating the uh, Texas War for Independence. And I mentioned that, uh, uh, yeah, and they instituted the worst slavery laws in America on their first day. And he said, oh, well, no, that really wasn't much of a part of it. And I thought to myself, <laughs> this guy doesn't know any Texas history at all. Yeah, right, for sure. I mean, the, the origins of Texas had everything to do with slavery. And, and that, by the way, is a working class history, right? That um, yeah, the people who came, the, the Anglos who came and migrated here, um, even after Mexico had, had barred them from, from migrating, they came illegally and they, uh, and they came to bring slaves and they seceded from Mexico in order to work enslaved people, right, to the death to the bone and extract profits from, from adding Texas to the cotton empire. And so they, yeah, it goes way back. And I believe it's true that they had the worst uh, anti-black codes in the South, worse than anybody. Uh, free black was not even allowed in Texas under the original, uh, when they first put their constitution together. Yeah, right. So that's, that's one of the problems that you brought up that, uh, People don't know about labor history and it's basically because the employers control all the information sources. What's the other thing? Well, okay, so, you know, we were talking about where, where, did, where did the labor movement go wrong, go right? And, and so maybe just to back up, you know, I think that there's a lot of different overlapping issues. So, you know, just in talking about slavery, right? As a labor system, um, you know, I think most union members, most workers today, if you ask them about the history of labor, they would think that those kinds of stories, right, about enslavement and about resistance on the plantations and about, 
um, struggles against racism, that those were, you know, not, not the, the, the real center thrust of labor history when in fact they very much are. So that's one issue is just where do we define it? Uh, to take another example, in Texas in the 1880s and 90s, there was a mass movement of farmers, of small farmers, right, who organized uh, first a huge network of cooperatives uh, and ultimately a political party, right, which, which merged with other groups around the country to become the People's Party, the populists. Uh, and in Texas, it was, you know, in much of the South, it was biracial. There was, a, there was another all Blacks, at the time they said Colored Farmers Alliance, that, uh, that brought together small farmers and even sharecroppers, tenant farmers in this mass movement um, in which they directly confronted the railroads and the banks that were, that were controlling uh, their livelihoods. And, and so again, that to me is another example of, of labor history we don't often talk about. Yeah, um, hardly, but then if we get to the 20th century, there's much more, but yeah, go ahead. The People's Party is hardly even mentioned in, uh, in any history of Texas. And yet, uh, I think the building where they had their meeting in downtown Dallas, I think the building is still there. It's, it's a furniture warehouse. But yeah, the People's Party was uh, was very big. And yeah, I mean, look up the look up the Cleburne demands, right? The opening salvo of the uh, the Southern Alliance movement, and it it's some radical stuff in there. And you know, it, they they called for the nationalization of the entire um, uh, transportation and communication systems in, in the nation. It's akin to, you know, if today we declared, you know, interstate trucking and the airlines public institutions and took over the internet and said it was going to be a public utility rather than a bunch of private um, private businesses. So, you know, we, yeah, they had some really um, stark ideas. And, and at, the, at the root of it was that they believed in, in um, cooperation and in democracy, which, you know, at the idea were still concepts that were viable before capitalism came and crushed it. Uh, and so- <laughs> I've met people from Cleburne. A lot of Cle people from Cleburne worked in my plant, and they hadn't the slightest idea that the People's Party was started there in Cleburne. Yeah, we should. We need to put up a marker or something. It's important yeah, okay. history. That um, would be great. Although I don't know if we could ever get the Johnson County uh, Commission to sign off on that. On the on the general topic of <laughs> what's wrong with labor, or what's wrong with labor history, I think. I think I could say truthfully, that one could read labor history, not just Texas, but all American labor history, one could read it for a lifetime and not see that labor ever did anything wrong. Mm -hmm. We're talking about how, how we could correct our wrongs. There aren't any wrongs in those labor histories. Uh, they were written by, usually by successful uh, union leaders of one kind or another and as far as they're concerned everything they did was was right uh, here's an example this is the brothers Ruther written by Victor Ruther and I would say that this this is one of the best one of the better anyway labor histories that I have read in fact it is the only one that authoritatively says that the AFL-CIO was tied hand and foot to the Central Intelligence Agency for many decades, that the AFL-CIO received money from the CIA and supported CIA programs in other countries. And yet that's something that a lot of people know, but you don't find it in a book other than this one. Victor Ruther actually went to an AFL-CIO convention and denounced them for, for their ties to the CIA. Yeah, no, that's a good, I mean, it's a good example, but you know, I, I would say that we do have, we have the institutional labor histories sometimes written by union officials and by, by their families or something like that. Um, but you know, we do have a, a sort of separate and independent world of labor history that really uh, took on new force beginning with the kind of the rise of the new social movements in the 60s and 70s. In fact, there was a field called the new labor history um, and, and one of the, you know, early, one of the leading practitioners still today and, and a, a great early author uh, named Nelson Lichtenstein has, has written a lot about the Ruthers, right, to take that example further. Uh -huh. And so what Nelson did in his first book, uh, Labor's War at Home, and then a, a later book, uh, a biography of Walter Ruther, when the title of that book is The Most Dangerous Man in Detroit, 
right? And, um, and he plays with that because on the one hand, that's what the industrialists called Ruther for challenging their authority and their, and their control over the city and of the industry. Uh, but he also shows in those early works the ways in which Ruther pivots um, by the end of soon after the war um, to embracing virulent anti-communism. Um, he, he was never pro-communist, but he was somewhat more neutral in the early days uh, and embracing American empire, right? And so Ruther, Ruther makes the shift from in 1946 asking for General Motors to open the books right, and to make the, the company essentially controlled by workers, right, in a German style model, um, he, you know, what we might think of now. He goes from saying, open the books, and we want a bigger piece of the pie, to instead accepting, you know, labor management piece, um, accepting the, the real, the, 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 the imperative for labor leaders to limit shop floor militancy, um, and accepting ultimately the Treaty of Detroit in 1950, a five-year contract with a bunch of, uh, of benefits and, and pensions and everything else and good wage scales. And he says that rather than a bigger piece of the pie, right, the United Auto Workers need to seek out uh, a, a bigger pie, right? And that that means that they have to collaborate with management and with US empire, um, including, right, extending those markets through the Cold War and ultimately, right, through nefarious, um, partnerships with the CIA and beyond. So that's been pretty well documented now. There were a bunch of rank and file labor union members going back to the 80s and even the later 70s that started to uncover and expose the depth of CIA labor collaboration. You know, starting one, one famous example, of course, is the, the coup against Allende in Chile uh, in 1973. Um, but that was revealed just a few years later. And, uh, and, and now, you know, folks in my field, professional historians have, have started to write those books as well. Um, but, but right, I think, um, you know, organized labor to this day, I think has um, the ongoing question of how is it going to relate to America's imperial ambitions and, um, and America's sense of exceptionalism. And, and I don't think, you know, I think what, if we learned anything from the last several decades since say NAFTA, or, you know, of course, globalization started before that, it's that the working people of the United States are not going to prosper at the expense of the working people of the rest of the world. That's not a long-term strategy. <laughs> so um, they're gonna need to find a different, a different route. Well, you mentioned the Treaty of Detroit. Now really, that's kind of a generic term because it kind of covers several union contracts that were signed around that time, primarily by the United Auto Workers. But is it not true that it was in that period, in those contracts, that the United States uh, labor movement gave up on national health care and gave up on strengthening social security and instead took uh, employer provided prevent, uh, pensions and employer provided health care, which tended to leave the rest of the working class behind. And just, uh, in other words, they just got things for their own members and stopped representing all the workers. Yeah, that's correct. I mean, that was part of the part of the treaty from labor's vantage point was that they secured those benefits and they could focus on other things. And they did leave behind the rest of the working class. And, um, you know, I think we can look a little further back in terms of why that decision came to be. You know, if, if we look at the first years of the Great Depression, there were widespread working class movements that were outside of the House of Labor, right? There were uh, unemployed councils, there was the Workers' Alliance of America, both of those groups were, were communist affiliated, but there was a whole bunch of local movements, right, in which working people came together to demand relief, to demand public welfare, right, saying that the private charities were not sufficient. And with the election of, of FDR, there was, you know, a tremendous amount of optimism that that was going to take place, and to a great extent it did. Um, but of course, the, the system, the, the welfare state that, that, that the New Dealers created was bifurcated. There were people who were let into it and people who were excluded from it. And the people let in were white male industrial workers and, and, and folks who were becoming white, European second wave new European immigrants from Southern and Eastern Europe who were, you know, whose whiteness very much gets solidified by their inclusion in the New Deal state. Um, and then, you know, there's categorical exclusions of, of, uh, of domestic workers, of agricultural workers, um, the folks who we still sometimes today forget about when we when we talk about labor history, 
But the, you know, what that meant was that over 80% of black women were excluded from the key provisions of the New Deal. And that included the Wagner Act, and it included the Social Security Act, mm -hmm. and, uh, and a bunch of other provisions. And so, um, you know, that combined with, over time, the shift in, um, you know, toward a, a more commercial approach to economic recovery through the housing market and other places, you know, we end up seeing, um, eventually, Taft-Hartley, which, you know, takes what little bit of, of good labor law there was and turns it against the workers who were covered by it. That was the law that was passed in 1947 that, that kind of set the path of destruction for American uh, labor movement. Yeah, I mean, to some extent, yeah, sure. It, it takes the Wagner Act and it turns it against working people. It, it bars the secondary boycott. It bars the sympathy strike. It, it limits the sit down strike it and it and it excludes communists from labor's ranks some of the best organizers that were out there uh, and it also creates right to work as an option right um, yeah it enables it, right to work not to closed shop yeah so that unions could never again uh claim the dues from all the members that they represent well and fundamentally control the hiring process right as mm -hmm. well but um but yeah, right, to get to your question, so so in that context, the United Auto Workers, the Brothers Ruther, you know, they do turn against um, against the communists in their ranks and against many of the civil rights activists, black and white in their ranks. Um, they consolidate control over the union. They negotiate this treaty with, with GM and the other big automakers that becomes the pattern for the industry and indeed for all of basic industry. And they, um, and they embrace what we've called a, a public-private welfare state, a hybrid uh, sense of provision so that, yeah, they, their members get the benefits, their members get the health care, the pensions. Um, but they, they um, even as they, I think they did fight for the expansion of U.S. liberalism, um, those particular issues were not foregrounded, right? And, um, and we've definitely seen that come back to, to bite working people, right? When after the 70s and 80s hit, and um, and companies start, you know, automating more, offshoring more, or um, you know, the runaway plants and everything else that we collectively put into the idea of deindustrialization. Um, and suddenly, there's no there's no um, basis for those private welfare provisions, and there's no public alternative. And here we are, you know, all these years later, and we're still arguing about whether we can have a, a public option or Medicare for all. Um, yeah. But so clearly that would that would do a lot to help working people. Right. So one of the problems with uh, labor history then is it's really hard to correct errors that you've never admitted that you had. If you never admitted that you did these things mm -hmm. or that they were wrong, uh, then how do you correct it? And the, the new leadership in the AFL-CIO has tried uh, valiantly to do a much better job and to reach out and to stand up for, for example, for uh, a national health care. Uh, but without admitting that it was those very labor leaders uh, a few years before that, that had, had uh, come, had, had allowed the other side to, to take the advantage that they did. Now, let me ask you about this, because this came up for me on Facebook just in the last 24 hours. One, one post by one of my young radical Facebook friends <laughs> said the AF of LCIO was created by the government to mislead the working class and that we should all uh, join uh, the industrial workers of the world. I took issue with that and said, <laughs> said uh, that the AF of LCIO is doing a very good job now uh, and, and is overcoming some of the problems of the past. Then later, another, uh, another activist wrote something similar. And again, I stood up for the AF of LCO. And uh, this guy said uh, that the AF of LCO was only concerned about American workers and thus, the, thus, thus they were xenophobic. In other words, they were not uh, any help at all in the worldwide struggle of working people. And I wrote back, no, they're doing the best they can in the conditions that they're, that they're in. But you can see why certain people, certain young radicals 
would uh, would uh, would have some argument that the AFL CIO has not uh, historically been uh, uh, as good as they could have been. And I think that that's that's what's wrong with labor. If if labor today, if labor leaders today would say we made a mistake in giving up on national health care, and now we're trying to find our way back, if they would say that, I think uh, we'd be stronger. Yeah, I think you're right. I mean, there there's no there's no evidence, as far as I know, that the state had anything to do with the creating the AFL or the CIO, <laughs> and um, so I, I think that's totally off base. But I, you know, the old wobbly critique that the that the AFL unions were too close to management, you know, I think has some merit. <laughs> and, and and of course, as we've just talked about, that the the AFL and the CIO both uh, and together have at different junctures been far too close to the to the state and to the Democratic Party and unable to um, and unable to push them and and stay consistent for their members. So. You know, one one area where I think we've seen very clear change is uh, on the immigration front, right? The AFL-CIO, through all of its history, was anti-immigrant. It was very much nativist, and that that changed beginning in the 1990s, and um, and has very much become, you know, a real center point of the AFL-CIO today. That if, it, if they understand that if they were not organizing immigrant workers, they there would be even more of a shell of themselves um, right now and going into the future. You know, and I think that the, the labor leadership has done a pretty good job at, at coming to embrace Black Lives Matter, at least rhetorically. I think they have a long ways to go on that front. But but in any case, um, you know, those are some some marked shifts. And and what I would say is today, you know, labor leaders do need to be honest about what has worked and what hasn't and um, and about some of the missteps. Um, but I think, you know, there's, there's a couple different elements to that. I think there needs to be um, some discussion around around organizing, right? That uh, and putting resources into new organizing and forms of organizing that look different from from the organizing of the past. And we see some of that through the alt labor uh, campaigns that have emerged. Um, but you know, I think the question of electoral engagement is going to remain a big one, and and it's an area in which uh, other other not just radicals but progressives. Um, Look at organized labor and and find it lacking, right? That any Democrat is good enough, and um, and you know, sometimes and even if they'll vote the right way on on the labor bill, I'm not sure that that is true. <laughs> and um, and you know, I think the the labor movement should should think about some 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 principles, some platforms, right? That they're going to actually use as as a as a yardstick for how to get involved with politics. I was really excited about the Working Families Party. I, I remain excited, and it's growing in Texas, uh, among other places, where there's, you know, it's emerging as a sort of, um, you know, caucus within the Democratic Party and pressure group outside it simultaneously. And, you know, I think we have to we have to keep doing that. And and even even the old labor scorecards, I think, um, are, are are too simplistic, right? That um, we need to make sure that the politicians who claim they represent working people. Are actually showing up and and um, engaging in working class struggles, and um, and that they're not just being uh, bought and paid for by um, by the opponents of the working class, and um, and we I think we see that far too often that, that there are politicians who try to play both sides. They'll take the big corporate contributions and come out and tell us that they're pro labor, and I just don't buy it. Well, as we as we get toward uh, winding this up. I want to kind of take back everything else I said, because we've been looking at what's wrong. I mean, I said, I, I deliberately asked you to speak on what's wrong. And we've pointed out some things that we think could be better. But to my radical young friends of today, I want to say this, there are basically two armies in the world. One is the employers and the other one is our side, the employees, the people who have to work for a living. And we may not agree with our generals and our colonels and our brass and our officers on our side, but that's still our army. We're still on that side. And even though we may have some criticisms, uh, the, the overall aspects of, uh, of, of struggle today, 
will will not benefit by divisions. We will we will have to pull together. First of all, we have to recognize what side we're on, and then we have to uh, we have to apply ourselves to our side, and uh, not just play the boss's game by by standing aside and criticizing. And, and because of that, I want to bring up your book again, because in fact, even in this period that we've talked about in which labor made a lot of mistakes, there were people, and you wrote about them, who were doing a fabulous job and who were valiant beyond all measure, uh, put their lives on the line right here in Texas. It's in the book, Blue Texas by Max Crockmall, and I recommend it to everyone. Well, thanks, Gene. Yeah, and I think that's a good point. You know, um, I, I would say another big part of the labor history story is that it, it's very much focused still on those Northern um, industrial workers in the snow belt, right? The, the, the Michigan story becomes, or the Pennsylvania story becomes the national story. And, and in fact, you know, if you look beyond that industrial heartland, workers all over America uh, and beyond, but throughout the United States, have have long um, have long turned to unions as a way to try to improve their condition, right? Along with other forms of mutual aid societies and and self help organizations, community organizations, neighborhoods, civil rights groups, and um, and labor has represented a really important tool for for justice struggles for people who have been able to. Um, you know, carve out space within the labor movement to do that. And, and even the institutional forms of labor, right? So the text in my book, I write about the Texas AFL-CIO that in the 1960s um, very much committed itself to, uh, well, actually doing what you were talking about, recognizing some of their past wrongs and, and making some really big adjustments. And in their case, that meant understanding that, that they had soft pedaled the race issue for too long, that they had accepted segregation of the work site and of, the, of their unions and of their communities and that they needed to change that for their in order to advance the labor movement um, as well as you know for humanitarian and ethical moral reasons and, and and so they did and in the 1960s they they really did put their money where their mouth was and invest in organizing workers of color invest in forming political coalitions with civil rights groups um, and really prioritizing the issues of, of civil rights groups both black and and mexican american and um and so I think that's a wonderful model and, and uh, and starting point for us to think about, you know, what does it look like to build progressive coalitions in our cities and in our state today? Um, you know, organized labor is still there, and they, there's, um, you know, there's there's still some big work sites that uh, and and big important struggles happening in those places, um, and they're they're largely cut off, right, from. Um, from the work that people are doing, uh, say, for police accountability or for immigrant rights, we aren't talking to each other as much as we need to be uh, and educating each other enough about what those different struggles are. And I think that, you know, one of the main points of the book is that that doing that work, collaborating and building coalitions um, with folks who aren't like you um, doesn't mean that you have to give up your independence and your autonomy, but rather that um, by understanding and, and putting those differences on the table, we're able to actually communicate about them and, and build new alliances and, and build power for all working people. And that a key ingredient to that is, you know, is that, uh, that the most secure workers, and, and that usually means white workers, you know, do need to take a, a bit of a back seat and, and try to understand um, the struggle as it looks to, to people of color and, um, and to really put those issues and priorities first. And, um, and I think we've seen that happen in a number of spots. Um, but you know, the, I, the next labor upsurge is gonna be rooted in, I, I think, um, you know, not just traditional worksite organizing, but full on um, rebellions in, in that, you know, really connect uh, quality of life and community issues um, with, with workplace issues and that see them as, as interconnected. And also then that, um, carry forward into the electoral arena. So building progressive coalitions is the task before us. And people should recognize that organized labor can be the core of those progressive coalitions. It certainly can be an important part of every progressive coalition. Organized labor needs to change maybe to some extent, 
but so does everybody else if we're going to become uh, the kind, if we're going to develop the kind of power that we need to face the future. Thanks so much. I've talked to Max Crockmile, history professor in Fort Worth, Texas. And thank you very much, Max. And I'll be getting back to you soon. This is Gene Lance on the Workers Beat Extra.